Hey everybody, welcome to the Sharp Tongue Podcast. I'm your girl, Jessie Mae Peluso. Thank you so much for your patience with this week's episode. I'm coming to you live from Mallorca, Spain. Well, not live, but recorded on top of an orange in a hotel room in Mallorca, Spain. And I appreciate your patience with our audio. It may not be as spectacular, but we're here nonetheless. And welcome to all of our new listeners from the Honeydew episode with Ryan Sickler. Hey guys, what's going on? This is a Grief Survival Guide episode, episode 16 from the Grief Survival Guide mini series. And we're going to be going into what we learn about grief coming off the heels of the last Grief Survival Guide mini series episode with Tony Robbins. Not him specifically, but my experience there. And we're going to get into all sorts of avenues of dealing with grief after about a year and a half. Because, you know, my parents are dead. They're dead, damn it. But, hey, not all is lost. That's what you learn with loss. Not all is lost. But if you guys want to go over and check out the Patreon, we're posting new clips to the fan page. That's patreon.com forward slash Jessie Mae Peluso. As well as my other podcasts that are picking back up after my hiatus the Deuce with Mike Tully. We're posting new episodes. That's a Patreon exclusive. Uh, Patreon.com forward slash The Deuce podcast. And my other Patreon exclusive episode, oh, podcast with my partner, Carly Aquilino. That is picking back up as well. Girl, G Y R L. Uh, Patreon.com forward slash girl. You guys can join that. All things girl related. We talk about our dating life and what it means and feels like to be a woman today. It's a fun, fun podcast and we take your questions as well. Email us at girlpod at gmail.com. G-Y-R-L-P-O-D at gmail.com. And as well, here at Sharp Tongue, we're accepting your calls, your emails. If you guys want to call us and leave a question or get some advice from Dr. Peluso or Jesse Mae Peluso, myself, please give us a call, 513-916-0930, or shoot us an email, Comedy at gmail.com, and you guys can be featured on the podcast. Thank you so much. If you want to watch the podcast, go to the YouTube page, youtube.com forward slash Peluso, and you can watch all the videos of the podcast. This week, we couldn't record video because of where we're at, but there will be a video available. It just will be a static image to go along with the audio. And without further ado, thank you guys so much. Thank you to all the new fans from the Honeydew podcast with Ryan Sickler, my brother from another mother. And thank you to all my existent fans. I may sound a little run down. I promise you I'm not. I'm in a very, oh wait, I might be on an edible. I might be on an edible, but I feel great. I am um, in Spain recording for you guys a new episode for the Grief Survival Guide miniseries. This is episode six. I hope you guys enjoy it. Sharp Tongue Podcast. Beep, 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 beep. You're listening to the Sharp Tongue Podcast. I'm your host, Jessie Mae Peluso. It's a personal look. Well, it's not really a look because it's a podcast. I'm already fucking this up. This is kind of like a verbal comedy diary. A deep look into the crevices of my mind. It's gonna get dirty. You might cry. you probably laugh. Hopefully you'll laugh. The whole point is for you to laugh, but you also might cry. I talk about my family. I talk about farts. farts. I talk about love, loss, comedy, how hard it is to make it in this biz. I'm a fucking professional. Each week it's something different. Sometimes I have a guest host. Sometimes it's gonna be a movie companion episode. Sometimes I just ramble about the bullshit I dealt with the week before. You never know what you're gonna get. It's raw, uncut, and funny. It's me. Hey everyone, this is a real high, high production episode. I have my cell phone resting on an orange in a hotel room in Mallorca, Spain. So your girl is officially a world traveler and welcome to another grief survival guide episode. This is episode 16. I can't believe it's been so long, but the reality of trying to document going through grief while you're going through grief is that one of the things we've learned, grief has its own timeline. So it's not like you can rush that process. And I have been a person who has tried to maintain as much authenticity in my experience while 
recording episodes of the podcast. So I appreciate your patience in the releasing of this episode. The last grief episode we did, I believe, was November 16th. 2021 and that was unleash how to unleash your grief uh with bony robbins <laughs> me which was an episode based off of what i learned from my experience with the tony robbins unleash the power within event in palm beach florida and talking about our belief systems how we handle our depression and sharing all of my experience with what i learned from being in that environment, being in the Tony Robbins environment of it all, which definitely was an important process in my grief, for my mother specifically. Because if you listen to that episode, which I I was just going to say I implore you to do, but I don't think it needs to be that dramatic. (laughs) I implore you. Please go listen to me talk more. But I do talk about how on her death death anniversary, her death anniversary, there was a dragonfly on stage. And those of you who know, some of you who may not, I have two tattoos of dragonflies that I got with my mother. So matching tattoos. Dragonflies were very symbolic. And they are symbols that exist within the grief space we've discussed that as well based off of um, a different grief survival guide episode where i talk about the book signs that i read that talked about all the different signs there are in correlation to grief and dragonflies being one of them you know dragonflies and um freaking uh I was just going to say unicorns. Oh my God, my mom and I, we have a unicorn thing and I saw a unicorn. No, dragonflies and hummingbirds and butterflies. These are all very common symbols and very common talismans for a lot of people. Um, But this book, Signs, A Secret Language of the Universe by Laura Lynn Jackson was a book specifically about the signs we see in correlation with our death and with the death of our loved ones. So the dragonfly is not any sort of unique sign when it comes to this situation. But for my mother and I, it was a very specific thing. We, for holidays, would buy each other dragonfly. I had a dragonfly pen and shirts and notepads and accessories for your cell phone, towels. Like It just went on and on and on, all the stuff we would buy for each other. So dragonflies were always a symbol for my mother and I specifically. Not even my mother and my sister. They had a fucking squirrel. They had their own shit, you know? So and I want to get into, you know, the interpersonal relationship you have with your loved one in a minute. But to touch on this Tony Robbins thing, that dragonfly that showed up on November 13th, which was her death anniversary, threw me for a fucking loop, y'all. Threw me for a fucking loop. That was that was definitely intense. And it could have been anything. It could have been any creature that I saw. But, you know, I think that event, besides my mother showing up as a fucking dragonfly on stage with Tony Robbins, had... A huge impact on me and you know if you listen to the episode it it really pivoted the path I was on and it really made me realize I was depressed I had experienced years of depression on and off and didn't even know it with dealing with my toxic relationship that ended in a restraining order dealing with the emotional wake of that and the you know sort of emotional tsunami that occurs after that for anybody out there I've podcasted about it on other people's podcasts but dealing with somebody with borderline personality disorder my heart goes out to anybody who's struggling with that my heart goes out to anybody who's dealing with somebody who's struggling with that it is no easy task 
And I don't wish it on anybody, and I don't think it's anybody's responsibility to fix anyone. But that was a very heavy relationship that I went was in and had to get a restraining order up for. And that bled right into my dad being sick. And then my dad passing away, that bled right into the quarantine. And then my mother being sick and my mother passing away. And that was from 2016 to 2020. And it, I didn't realize the different levels of grief that exist in our lives until I went to that Tony Robbins event. That's why it's important to put yourself in different scenarios. It's important to get yourself out of your comfort zone because that's when you start to really make a pivot. That's when you really start to see where you're at. Only when you take yourself out of your consistent path do you really see what path you're on. You have to shake it up. You have to... um, get out of your comfort zone in order to step into your evolution. And in order to really recognize that you're even in a certain place, if you stay in your comfort zone, you're, there's no parameter. There's no understanding of where you're at in life. Because you can't even see it. Because you're just doing everything in this sort of robotic fashion. And that's that's people in general. I think people have a hard time challenging themselves. And that goes back to like survival and wanting to be in survival mode. And just survival mode being our... Um, just our... our modus operandi like it's survival mode is is just what we're in so that we can get through life but only when you sort of put a peg in the wheel of your existence and throw yourself off of your own bike and land on your ass and get a little cut up do you sort of get shook out of your own numbness that numbness is death it truly is And you have to shake shit up. You really do. And it's so uncomfortable. It's the fucking worst. That Tony Robbins thing, that wasn't easy. And there's a lot other harder, much more difficult things you can do to get yourself out of your fucking head and get yourself out of your your, your hamster wheel your emotional hamster wheel. There's a lot more difficult things you can do. And these are just things I'm talking about that are like preemptive decisions you're making, like a concerted effort to evolve. Most people don't get out of their comfort zones until life throws them on their ass. An unexpected illness, an unexpected accident, uh, some traumatic event. And you, and you think in your life, for me personally... Those traumatic events define you and really they don't have to um, they, they don't have to determine you. You know, I talked about this in my last stand-up special that I've recorded where your, your, your trauma can define you and it will define you, but it doesn't have to determine you. It doesn't. And the determination falls on you to decide who are you going to be on the other side of this trauma, this grief, this experience that has changed you. You have the power and the ability to take control of that. And it takes getting kicked in the ass to realize that and that's you know what the what the Tony Robbins event did for me and my grief how it made me realize just how deep I was in it and just how comfortable people can get drowning so many people are way too comfortable drowning 
way too fucking comfortable with it. And I don't even know if comfort's the right word. We use that, you know, we say things like misery loves company and people like to stay in their comfort zones. I think we even call it a comfort zone to try to trick ourselves to think or believe that immobility and a static existence is comfortable. We fucking know it's not. We know it's not, but it's easier to say it that way. It's just the process to get out of that deep end is the grueling part. That's the part that takes a lot of willpower and a lot of resilience and fucking pain. But it's almost like, as I'm saying this out loud, thinking about the process, getting out of your comfort zone or getting out of your depression and and being in that depression can feel comfortable per se only because that doesn't require you to evolve. But thinking about the process evolving out of this depressed static space and this depressed static experience the evolution process from that is so painful. It reminds me of a birth of sorts. And I think along the path of life, if we're really approaching it in a position of wanting to grow, that we're constantly being reborn. And I'm not being, I'm not speaking from a religious standpoint. I'm speaking from an existential standpoint where if you don't stay in these depressed zones, if you don't stay in the de- the deep end of depression, you can evolve out of that and you are reborn into something new. After that Tony Robbins event, I was a totally, totally different person. And even today... You know, that was November 16th, 2021. Here we are, July 7th, 2022. We're rounding up at the end of the year. It's going to be two years since my mother died. It's been, I I can't do math, November, December, January, February, March, April, May, June, July. Eight months since the Tony Robbins event for me. And I am a, a different person from then. And it's... I think one of the greatest gifts I've gotten from this grieving process is not giving a fuck, truly not giving a fuck. And that's not to say I don't care. What I used to care about doesn't bother me anymore. What used to bother me does not bother me anymore. If you guys hear a sound, it sounds like someone's peeing and that's just water in the walls. Okay, it's just some Spanish water in the walls. And I appreciate your patience ahead of time with this recording not being as high quality as we normally like to have it. I don't know what my mouth just did there. (laughs) So thank you for your patience. But I, I honestly, I think that who I am today is, is even just a totally different evolution from the Tony Robbins event, it's, it takes a while for, for the new person to show up. And I'm still getting to know who I am on this side of everything. But the greatest gift from grief for me has been learning to let go. And I think that's what you do when you become someone new is you're letting go of the toxic people, things, places, ideas, that were holding me back. And I know I am and have evolved because I'm having more fun. I'm really having more fun. And the other thing with grief, I remember seeing a comment I don't know, I was on like a Whitney Cummings podcast or something and I had like dressed up and someone had commented, it's nice to see Jesse May not dress like a homeless person. <laughs> it's 
the one thing when you're grieving, oof, your effort is so minimal. You're you're barely brushing your hair. You're wearing grays. You're wearing loose fitting grays, dirty hair, and a scornful face. Grief has no fashion sense. Let's be real. True grief? <laughs> okay. <laughs> Welcome to Grey Gardens, bitch. Welcome to the sale section at a filing's basement in 2005. Okay? You probably don't, half of you probably don't even know what the fuck that store is because it's shut down. Welcome to the sales section of a dollar store. That's what your fashion sense is when you're grieving. And I know I'm happier because I'm wearing color. <laughs> I'm wearing color now, bitch. Are you kidding me? Listen. J- just same way how you don't know you're depressed. Sometimes you, you don't even know you're happy. And you got to look down and be like, oh shit, I'm wearing yellow. Today's a good day. You know, the last Netflix show I shot, well, no, the, the tattoo redo. No, no, no. Wait. No, just this last one in Greece. Yes, I'm thinking about it in my mind. I did the wardrobe with the wardrobe stylist. And, you know, even even the show I did with the Netflix show I did, the first one, the colors were you know, I, I still wasn't, wasn't living my best life. Like colors were very, very muted. Like, what are we doing here? You know, what are we doing here? And shout out to Melissa Lynn, who was a stylist for this most recent Netflix show. But the point is we went all out. We went all out for this, this show this time. We, we did color. We did honey. We had boas. We had there was silk, there was linen, there were prints, there was sky blue, bitch, we, it, royal blue, cobalt blue, bitch, you know you're not depressed when you're busting out some cobalt blue. I just really stepped into myself. That sounds very sexual and lonely at the same time. <laughs> That's just one of the funny things you don't even think about when you're grieving, the fashion of grief is something, you know, and it's, you don't even realize it, but people around you do. They sure do. They're like, damn, either she's, she lost her job or someone died. Cause that moo moo, she's been in it for two weeks. So now, you know, it's just another sign. And these things, as you're grieving, you know, we all know, well, some of us know it's not a linear process and it's a very individual personalized experience and the way things evolve for you are not going to be the same for other people so you have to be kind with yourself that's whenever one of my friends or somebody I know or even just fans reach out and tell me they're going through grief they're going through loss the first thing I say to them is be kind to yourself be kind to yourself we're so hard on ourselves. We're so hard on ourselves because we think we don't deserve to take time to mourn. And in this society, in, on this podcast, I've liked to try to destigmatize what, we, what is grievable because grief spans a spectrum of experience from losing a job to losing a loved one and everywhere in between the multitude of events that will cause you grief will probably be confusing to you because in the society we haven't acknowledged that. We haven't acknowledged that it's okay to grieve over the loss of a pet. It's okay to grieve over them killing Brad Pitt in Lost City. Spoiler alert. It's okay to grieve over, you know, them not having the oat milk brand you like. No, that's not okay. That's some real, real bullshit. But everything else is grievable and I think we we are hard on ourselves when we're going through a grieving process we're really fucking hard on ourselves because we don't live in a society where well let, let, let me put it to you this, this way we live in a society where we're only supposed to grieve 
grieve over dead people. And anything else is is off the books. And, and I think we're starting to evolve away from that as we talk about it more and have a real open conversation and, and people can feel more comfortable talking about the things that they've struggled through. But, bitch, if a dog dies, I'm going to need a couple weeks off of work. <laughs> you know? Listen, if when Chaplin goes, I'm going to fucking, I'm going to the Maldives for a month. I'm going to be honest. I think the reality is, is we're in such a fast paced society that even grief has a timeline for a lot of businesses. And that's starting to evolve, like I said. But I think it's important for you to be kind to yourself during this process. Don't be so hard on yourself. And it, whatever you're feeling is what you're feeling. It's not right. It's not wrong. It's just what you're feeling. And that's the most important thing to, to realize when you're feeling something. This is just something I'm feeling. It's a feeling. And it's not a fact, but it is something that you owe a moment to. And your feelings are directly related to what you, you're telling yourself about your life and who you are. And what you're telling yourself about your life and who you are is based off of a lot of factors. So because of that, how you grieve may be affected by how you think. And that's why it's important to improve your mindset and do what you can to get into a mindset that is healthy and that will allow you the space to experience grief from a standpoint of letting go and not a standpoint of holding on to more things. I think it's important for us to work through our mindsets because everything else permeates from that. Our mindset creates our reality in all elements of our life. Our interpersonal relationships, our work relationships, our relationships with loss, our relationships with our faith, our relationships with our our diet, our physical fitness. And a, a book that's really helped me is a book that was recommended from, oh, let me, I got to put it in my, I'm alone here. So let me, Molly's Game. What's this girl's name? Remember that, that movie Molly's Game? Molly Bloom. Molly Bloom was an addict and she was also the, um, you, you should check out this movie. Um, she wrote a memoir about her life and career. It's, it was called Molly's Game. They made a movie for it. Aaron Sorkin made and wrote the screenplay, but she began, um, she was an Olympic skater, but then she got into underground uh, poker and was tracked and essentially arrested by the FBI at the end of it all. But she also has spoken very openly about her addiction. And she accredits a lot of her healing to this book called An Untethered Soul. And I think I've talked about it before. Um, it's by Michael Allen Singer, An Untethered Soul, The Journey beyond yourself it's it's about kind of what I'm discussing about your mindset and and your thought process and it's important that you start to witness yourself that's what this book kind of goes into witnessing your thoughts instead of thinking your thoughts are who you are starting to witness what your thoughts are so then you can discover who you are. I know it sounds a little meta and deep, but once you read this book, which has a horse on the cover, hello, excuse me, I just bought it because of the horse. Let's be real. If there's a horse on something, I'm fucking buying it. Side note, Whitney Cummings has a whole horse room in her house that when I was over there last, because she just finally got her house all decorated beautifully and finished, she said it's my room now. So God bless. But this this book talks about it's basically literally a journey beyond yourself. We're so caught up in who we think we are. We make all of our decisions based off of, off of that. But the reality is who we are has been constructed by other people's trauma, other people's grief, societal grief. Who we are is the sum of so many other parts besides ourselves. And when you start to unpack all of that, you meet who you are. You, you discover who you are. And discovering yourself 
I think is the greatest journey one person can make. It's, it's the most important journey, I think. Meeting yourself. Because only then can you start to live authentically. And that's where I'm at. <laughs> Girl. Boy. Whoever you are. I'm staring 40 at the back of the head. I'm going to be 40 in a couple months. 40. And I just feel like I just got to know myself. That's wild. That's some trippy shit. That's not to say I haven't been authentic before. But that authenticity was based on someone else's story. It's also we don't realize that. So much of what we tell ourselves is so much of who we tell we se- I can't even say it. So much of who we tell ourselves we think we are is someone else's story. That's not who we think we are is not based on us. It's based on other people's influence. And when you start to unpack all that, you're like, oh, I don't give a fuck about this. That's what I was talking about earlier. You start to not give a fuck. And that's one of the greatest gifts that that grief has given me. The ability, once you start letting go and being able to let go of more, you create this space within yourself where you have some, an opportunity to take a break to step back and stretch your soul out a bit. And only then do you really realize, oh, this is what I needed in order to expand. Like creating space within yourself helps you expand in every avenue in your life. You get better rest. You make better and forge better relationships. You show up more authentic And you stop taking on other people's traumas and toxic energy as your own. And I'm just realizing this shit at 40, bitch. It's never too late. (laughs) It's never too late. Oh my God, I'm so hungry. I, I haven't eaten. I wanted to do this on an empty stomach because I feel like I can speak more honestly and I'm just before that place where I'm going to turn into Joe Pesci before he gets a Snickers. But then I realized, oh, we've got a sponsor this week that has to do with food. And it's going to make me ravenous thinking about it. But I'm so excited they're back. And it's it's Thrive Market. I love Thrive Market. It's very convenient. Even though I've said before, I do like to go grocery shopping and put on a cute outfit and try and find a rich dad in the produce department. Even like, actually the the butchery, the meat departments where you can really like, you know, find a fun opportunity. Be like, oh my God, what, what, what cut of beef is this? But Thrive Market is so worth it. I get everything I need and so much more in one place. You can shop everything from health pantry essentials, sustainable meat, hello, see? So you can kind of like, you can just pretend you're in the meat department at the grocery store. Um, they have seafood, non-toxic cleaning, and beauty products all delivered right to your door. And uh, if you find a lower price someplace else, Thrive Market's going to match it. Hello. They carefully vet each and every item so you can trust them if they sell it. And it's probably the highest quality available. You can find everything you need on Thrive Market because you can filter about 90 plus values and lifestyles to find what works for you. Shop for what you eat and what matters to you most. With over 5,000 food, home, and beauty products, finding what you need is easy with Thrive Market. I bought like four jars of olive oil apple cider vinegar. We talked about this. Cans of salmon. <laughs> it really is convenient. I like it because I can just, when I'm on the road, because you guys know I'm a jet jet setting bitch these days, I can just get it all set for when I show up. When, I'm, when I get back home, I have my whole Thrive Market right in my pantry, ready to go. You guys, you're going to be joining a community of over a million members and sponsoring a family in need when you join Thrive Market. So that'll make you feel good. And also, they've got fast and free carbon neutral shipping, and you're basically being a part of bettering the planet when you join the Thrive Market crew. 
the tribe, the, the Thrive Market tribe. Join it today and you guys can get $80 in free groceries. What? That's right. That's Thrive, T-H-R-I-V-E, market.com slash sharp, S-H-A-R-P, to get $80 in free groceries. That's thrivemarket.com slash sharp, S-H-A-R-P. $80 off of your groceries, guys. So go over there, get some cuteness, get some snacks, get a little face wash, and get yourself, get your belly and your heart full at Thrive Market. Thank you guys so much for being sponsors this week. I appreciate you. The one thing about grief is sometimes you forget to eat. Grief can make you so fucking forgetful. That's another reason why you need to be so kind with yourself and be patient with yourself. Me, I rarely forget to eat. I know I don't look like it. I'm a very, uh, I'm, a, I'm a fit thing, but I also, I, I poop often. So I'm very fortunate in that sense, but I also work out five days a week. But when I was grieving, totally different situation. I had to remind myself to eat and, you know, uh, not to extend this Thrive Market ad that we um, just read, but honestly, having something like that is really crucial if you're going through something difficult so that you don't have to worry about going out into the world because sometimes when you're grieving for the most part you don't want to be seen you want to stay in your gray snuggie or gray hoodie and just watch shit's creek over and over i watched shit's creek twice i rewatched grace and frankie and the next grief survival guide episode we're going to do will be grief tainment all the things that i watched and read and have absorbed as entertainment while I'm grieving I've found as I look at and looked at all the things that I was consuming all of it sort of was somewhat cohesive as far as the style of what I was watching and the things that I was putting into my mind body and soul if you you know if you will to process the grief all of it sort of had a little bit of a theme so I decided to compile all of the things that I watched, read, and ate into an episode as well. That'll be our next Grief Survival Guide episode. But that is a, a real truth that when you're grieving, you forget so much. Not just to eat, but you forget um, people's names. You forget dates. You forget what you're supposed to be doing, where you're supposed to be going, what day it is. It's an all-encompassing fog of fuckery. <laughs> That's what grief is. I have to write that down. An all-encompassing fog of fuckery. <laughs> There's uh, some movie. I I I gotta Google it to see what it is. Where they said something that that a line. There's fuckery afoot. Does anybody has anyone ever heard of that? There's fuckery afoot. Let's see if it pulls up on Google. Um, The Gentleman. Yeah, it's a great movie. Uh, She says there's fuckery afoot. It's just a great line. And it, that that's basically what grief feels like. A lot of fuckery. But not, not afoot. It's a fog of fuckery. And so you really got to be fucking kind to yourself. You got to... You got to realize... There's no timeline. And I think doing a, the year of grief in review, which essentially that's what this is, even though it's closer to two years. Let's let's count July, August, September. I'm going to be 40 in September. October, November. We're four months away from it being a two-year grief episode, which I still will do. But that just goes to show you that the timeline of it all isn't standard it's not standardized and the sooner you really realize that I think the the better off you are in in the 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 kinder you can be to yourself and I think for me it was so much heavier because it was my sec my last parent now I'm a fucking orphan you know, I've got my sister, but you always joke we're orphans and I have such a dark sense of humor when somebody tells me that both their parents are dead. I'm like, welcome to the orphans club. You know, I, I 
<laughs> finding your tribe through all, through death it's it, it it took me a little bit longer to process and i'm still processing it you know i don't think i don't think it's meant to be fully understood and dealt with it's kind of like life i don't think we're f- not that we're not meant to fully understand it. I think if we did fully understand it, it would take away a lot of the magic. And there's even magic in the darkness. There's magic in the trauma. And that's not to say to go out and do some traumatic shit to experience magic. You can do shrooms to do that. You don't need to go and run out and get yourself in a toxic relationship to you know, feel a little bit of magic. But what I am saying is that in those moments where you're in these adverse adversity and difficulties and difficult experiences there does exist a level of maybe magic is the wrong word um i think it, in that the challenging time there is a bit of fire no I, I think there is some kind of magic that comes out of that i think magic could be a result of it not necessarily the experience of it while it's happening but on the other side of it, processing it and realizing what you've gone through, you can experience some magic. And I think for me, after losing both of my parents, realizing I'm okay has been magical. <laughs> you know, I I haven't even mentioned, we're almost 40 minutes into this, that this is coming off the heels of me coming out and talking on Ryan Sickler's podcast, The Honeydew, for the first time about my mom last week. So a lot of you are probably here off the heels of that episode. Hey, what's going on? Um, thanks for thanks to all my my new fans. I you know had that was the first time that I actually like kind of really got into specifics about my mom even though we well not necessarily just it's the first time I've gone on somebody else's podcast to discuss something we we talk about here in these grief survival guide episodes so it felt very personal and and vulnerable to do that and I always love love Ryan and love his podcast so I felt like that was a fitting place to do it and to bring you guys over here and to extend the grief survival guide on sharp tongue podcast here But as I mentioned before, this book, An Untethered Soul, that's how it felt losing my parents. Once my mom died and then that was it, I felt untethered. I felt like my foundation was just gone and I was floating. And I've talked about this like fucking George Clooney in gravity. Remember when that motherfucker was just out there floating? That's how I felt emotionally after my mom died. I was like, oh, fuck, okay. This is cool. So we're just floating around. No foundation. No one, no, no home. That's what, you know, my parents were to me. They were my home. They were my emotional home. And even, you know, where I'm at now in Spain, I'm in, I'm in Mallorca, Spain right now. I want to call them. My mom, I would call my mom and dad like every other day. I talked to my mom almost every day. And... Um, it's hard hard doesn't even begin to describe it it's gutting it's confusing and it's humbling as fuck not being able to call or talk to my people it I think in that loss I think in like this moment right now that I'm in where I'm upset and feeling that loss. I believe in, in, in that lies all the truth. So many of us are looking for the meaning of life and so many of us want to understand things and so many of us want to conquer and complete grief. But the real truth about the meaning of everything lies in those moments when you're missing someone that love I think that is what everyone is searching for not to feel the loss but the feeling that creates the sense of loss that love 
I think Queen Elizabeth is the one that said, grief is love with no place to go. Let's Google it. We don't have to just whip these things up and make make it like we're not know for sure. I think Queen Elizabeth said, grief is love with nowhere to go. I could be wrong. Mm, some guy named Bill said it. Let's see what let's see what Queen Elizabeth said. She said something like that. On grief. Hold on, guys. Grief is the price we pay for love. That's what Queen Elizabeth said. And the other quote is a quote I do like as well. Um it, I do believe grief is love with nowhere to go. That was Bill, who is this? Bill Spence. Um, I think below both of those things is true. And you know what helps? After all this time, after both of my parents are gone, after all I've experienced in, you know, taking some time off of work, but also working and putting myself out there and allowing myself to grieve, but now coming on the other side of it, being more social these days and wearing color. I think the one thing that has remained for me, or the one thing that I've really learned is that I need to give myself space and that it's okay to feel it's okay to feel. It's okay to allow yourself a moment in time away from everything that you normally do to give yourself some space to really allow these emotions to come out. But that being said, it's equally if not more important to get out of that f- fuck, that fuckery, that fuckery of fog. What did I call it? all-encompassing fog of fuckery and get the fuck out go out for a walk that's why dogs are so amazing my I, I definitely wouldn't have been able to get through this past year and a half without my dogs because I you know I gotta take care of them I can't not take care of them fucking little chaplain with no teeth and his tongue hanging out the side of his face I'm not gonna take care of that so many factors in your life help you get out of that fucking deep end of depression. It takes a lot of different things. It's not one thing. Medication helps for some people, but medication alone isn't enough. You know, we've talked about that in other podcasts, something that I was inspired by from Erica Badu, the five doctors, Dr. Sleep, Dr. Spirit, Dr. Green, Dr. Exercise, and, and... um, the butt doctor. No, um, it's basically sleep, nutrition, exercise, spirit, and um, I forget what the f- fucking fifth one is. Let's Google Erica Badu's five doctors. We've talked about it, but it takes it takes a a, a lot to achieve everything. It's not just gonna be one fucking thing. It can't be one thing. Let's see. Let's play this. Let's see if we can play this. Wait, she's talking about the pineal gland. Hold on. Let's see if we can get this shit up. Oh, people are yelling at Erica. Hold on. Hold on. No, I can't find it. I was going to try and find it for us, but fuck it. Um, you get the point. So five doctors. Okay. There's five doctors and they're important. <laughs> okay. I do think it's spirit, sleep, nutrition, exercise, and sun. That was the fifth one. Sun. Got to get out there and get that fucking sun. It takes a plethora of things to help us get through the treachery of life. And we got to remember that. We've got to be patient and kind with ourselves and and try 
to get out of that zone, the fog of fuckery. As much as it's important to give your emotions a stage, give your emotions a vessel and a way to be expressed, you also equally need to do something to combat that. It's not great for your spirit to, to dwell in sadness. Roller skating on shrooms has really helped. Shrooms have helped. Dogs have helped. Sunshine, eating healthy, sleep. I mean, when you're depressed, you want to sleep, but you got to get out and get some fucking movement, exercise. You know, for me, psilocybin, there goes that wall, wall water again. You guys hear the wall water? Psilocybin sun and exercise and my dogs and cannabis and good food I see I can't even name one thing that's helped me the most during grief it's been a magnitude it's been a a toolbox of tools and I'm still accumulating them I'm still accumulating them the podcast has definitely helped talking about it feeling like my you know I'm still extending my purpose during this process And finding my purpose during this process, I do believe a part of my contribution to life is sharing what I've learned going through these different life-changing events and these traumatic events. And also when you hear somebody else is going through your shit, it can kind of get you out of your own fog of fuckery. It can motivate you a little bit I know that for myself when you're like oh okay okay J-Lo can be insecure I'm good I'm good I'm gonna go outside for a walk I'm gonna go for a walk and get myself a little get myself a little matcha latte and 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 flirt with the bodega guy you know live live my real life I think it's important to be kind to yourself I'm gonna keep saying it and and say it to your friends when they've gone through loss and reach out to your friends. I had a really good girlfriend of mine, Jackie, say she felt like she wasn't there for me, like she could have been during my loss. And she was. I retreated. I went inward. And that's something that I've done in the past where the way I deal with heaviness in my life is to turn into a hermit crab and pull it into my shell and to process it alone. And I even had a couple of people be like, oh, I haven't heard from you. Yeah, my mom died. <laughs> Been kind of busy. Been a little busy in my sheets eating cheese and crying into my chihuahua's neck. <laughs> So reach out to your people and don't make it about you. Oh, I haven't heard from you. Oh, I thought you were mad at me. No, going through some shit. It's important to reach out. If you haven't heard from somebody in a while, just say thinking about you, love you. You're doing great. Wanted to let you know you're doing great and you're loved and you're appreciated. Those little words, let me tell you, it's a boost for your spirit. That's a little shot of energy right to your heart's chakra. You know what I'm saying? That's a little boost. That's a boost for your root chakra if I haven't seen one. This whole grieving process has taught me so much about myself. It's taught me how I thought I was vulnerable, but I really wasn't. It's taught me how I thought I was outgoing, but I really was compensating it's taught me how to really be there for people and also to stop being there for the wrong people that's really what grief has shown me how to really be there for the right people and stop being there for the wrong people and it really is a purging process grief if you allow it to be and that might be happening and you don't even realize that's what's happening People might be like, oh, you're, you've changed or you might decide that you don't like 
a certain color anymore or a certain food or an attitude or a way of life. Grief forces you to purge the things that weigh you down. And if you fight against it, it'll be much more difficult. But if you, and I'm not saying this is easy because it is something I've struggled with. If you really learn to let go and and at least work on letting go of something that holds you down a little bit each day, I promise you, you're going to create more space for love in your life. The more you clear out your inner cobwebs, the, the more space you create for magic in your life. And it's so important to allow grief to be a purging process for you. To purge the people, places, and things that have been toxic. That you didn't even realize were toxic. And a lot of that is based off of trauma that was taught. And, and your, your mindset and how you think about yourself is other people's ideologies. Who we think we are is based on influence from other people. And that can, af- that can affect our grieving process. So I implore you to go check out the Untethered Soul book. And I also implore you to start a purging process for yourself. And maybe take some inventory of what you used to like. And what you like now. And in and, and do a little checklist on yourself. Maybe take a minute and check in with yourself and see how you've changed. You might not even fucking realize it. But the other thing I really want you to do is get the fuck out of your comfort zone. Or whatever you call it. That all-encompassing fog of fuckery. Get out of that. Just for five fucking minutes. Start small. It doesn't have to be a whole hike up to the the damn Appalachian Trail. Even though Cheryl Strayed is amazing for doing that. It's a big ass feat. She almost lost her feet from that feat. So you can start small. Go for a hike down to your, your local coffee shop. Get a coffee. The next day, strike up a conversation. The next day, bring a book and stay a little bit longer. It's all about building. Building up. And letting go. And allow yourself to purge. And I had to do that when I was in Greece, losing that necklace. Fuck. That hurt. That hurt, but it was just a thing. I think it's easiest to start with purging items and possessions. Maybe not easiest. Maybe that's not the right word. Important. Because if you can let go of these possessions and realize that what you're really holding on to is an idea and a memory, then you realize you can you always have that. You don't necessarily need items to trigger a memory. I'm not saying to get rid of everything. I I'm a sentimental person. I wear my mom's jewelry. I have it on right now. I'm looking at it. This and it, there's a gold bracelet and this like cheap brass bracelet and I have rings of hers I'm not saying get rid of everything but once you start to let go of possessions you're gonna create more room for love and that sounds wild but I promise you I've experienced it and like I said before, sometimes we're forced into these experiences that get us out of our comfort zone, these traumatic events. And I'm not saying losing my necklace was a traumatic event, but it did force me to check myself and my relationship to possession. And it was an unexpected experience that made me take a look at myself and question why my emotional reaction to this possession was so heavy. And as I dug deeper, it had nothing to do with the necklace, had everything to do with the loss of my dad. And that loss of the necklace symbolizing losing him again made me realize that there's still some grieving that has to be done. And there's always going to be grieving. Lucky us. (laughs) There's always going to be some grieving. But like I said... In that experience, 
that painful, painful, painful experience, it will give birth to something new. It'll give birth to something magical. It will create a new avenue, a new opportunity, a new idea that you couldn't have anticipated for yourself if you keep your mindset open to it. So check out that book. Go to that coffee shop. Try something new and uncomfortable. Even if it's just going to a party. This might shock you about me. I don't like necessarily used to. Now I more have been going out more and being social. I used to not like going to parties and social events. And this was even before quarantine. I'm not even using quarantine as an excuse to not go out. And I realize the more I put myself out there, the more... And I do stand-up comedy. (laughs) You know? But I'm a human being. But friends have been inviting me, and now I'm starting to say yes again. And feeling more able to show up and be social. There's a few, a handful of friends that I will always hang out with because they're like family. But outside of that, it was very restrictive with my energy and my space because I just was so caught up in the fog, the all-encompassing fog of fuckery (laughs) that I had no desire to shake myself of it. But I started small and now, you know, I'm going to house parties now. I'm out here doing house parties. I'm like a fucking pro. If I can do it, you can do it. Anything I can do, you can do better. I know it's not the song, but that's for this episode's sake. And it, it, it really is maybe the single most important experience of our life. Losing someone. Besides giving birth, losing someone. Losing someone important. There's a song, I'll give you a little teaser to our grief tainment episode, called When Someone Great Is Gone by LCD Sound Systems. Or I think it's called Someone Great. It's a song that I would listen to. And I don't even know if it's about death, but to me it is. And let's see, I'm going to look it up. It's such a good song. Um, It's the best song about loss ever written. It's a bold statement. It's also, oh no, this is just some, someone's article about this. Okay, so this one little chunk in this song get, puts a lump in my throat. And we'll get into it when we do the grief tainment episode. But this is one of the lyrics from the song. To tell the truth, I saw it coming, the way you were breathing. But nothing can prepare you for it, the voice on the other end. And that's like a a fucking phone call. You know, a a terrible fucking phone call that you're going to get. And we've got to stop anticipating those phone calls in life. We have to stop anticipating grief. We have to stop anticipating trauma and anticipating the downside of life because it will keep you there. The anticipation of something terrible will keep you in a terrible place. I want you to go out and create magic. I want you to go out and create new avenues and experiences and relationships for yourself and enjoy life and realize how amazing it truly is and like my mom said if you watched or listened to the honeydew with ryan sickler and i like my mom said we're always going to be okay we are so fortunate that's the one of the last lucid things my mom said to me before she died and you have to remember that you're always going to be okay And you're so fortunate. You're loved. And if you can live from that place, you might be able to get out of that all-encompassing fog of fuckery. (laughs) I hope you guys got something from this week's episode. 
we're still continuing the conversation about where do we go when we die. And if you have any past life, near-death experiences, ghost stories, something that has to do with the death of a loved one, please, I'm all ears, email us, jessiemaypelusocomedy at gmail.com. And don't forget, you can call the podcast. Our, we're, we're here to answer your questions. If you have advice or want advice, please hit us up, 513-916-0930. And I hope this episode helped you get through what you're getting through. There's so many resources and grief resources. I'll put them in the show notes, uh, places you can reach out and websites to help you guys get through your loss. And there's magic to be had and to be felt. And I hope this episode helped you a little bit. Thank you for listening. And I love you guys.